the recording here. And I'm going to share my screen real quick with everyone. And, and thank you again for everyone that, that's uh, making it out tonight on a Friday night. Hope all is well with you and your loved ones during this, this kind of stressful time. Um, of course, the English camp is tentative at this moment, but we will keep you updated via that newsletter as well as our COVID page on our website. Um, just, just stay updated through checking that, but also newsletter is the best way to do it or just emailing me. Um, but anyways, without further ado, um, this is our first Global English Camp Alumni Series webinar. Very happy to have Jordan here with me. As you can see, we're good buddies from that picture there. <laughs> uh, and we'll be doing these over the course of the next few months while we're marketing the program because a big part of English Camp for us, myself, Jordan, Zane, any other alumni that are here, is really the community that we build. Uh, we Over the past five years, we've had so many incredible interns with different stories and not only while you know their experiences in English camp but what they're doing now which of course Jordan will be talking about uh, because he lives in Japan and works out there right now as we speak so uh, well of course right now he's enjoying his weekend <laughs> and so just to say out loud thank you Jordan for taking time out of your weekend to do this our, our very first uh, series and so look for in our newsletter uh, upcoming webinar series maybe Zane will be on there Maybe some other alumni will be on there to share their specific experiences. Um, but then in addition to that, like I said, we will have official info sessions where myself or alumni will be presenting uh, about the camp in its entirety. So it will be an hour focused entirely on the camp, entirely focused on your questions. So if we don't get to any now, of course, email us or type it in the chat, but we will also be answering those at our next info session. And so please sign up for the newsletter. Uh, we just send it out once every two weeks and the next one we'll have our first info session and just to go into the schedule here give you guys an idea of what we're going to be talking about uh, for the first part we will be talking about jordan's experience in the english camp specifically how that's been an impact in his life and then after that we'll talk talk about his experience because he has studied abroad there he did grad school there and like i said he's working and living in tokyo so we'll we'll talk about that have a brief time for some Q&A at the end via chat and maybe some live questions, which is, which is nice. We'd like to do that to see your faces and hear your voices. And then, like I said in the email, which I know for many of you it went to spam, sorry about that. This is our first time with, and we had so many people signed up. Uh, I will do a brief Q&A for Global English Camp. But you know, in that allotted time, I probably won't get to all your, your questions. So appreciate your your understanding of that and, and appreciate your patience in waiting for our first official uh, info session. So um, to start the uh, webinar, I'll introduce myself and admit these five people waiting. Uh, I am Matt Pollock, the program director for Global English Camp and I've been when I'm coming out of Japan and I've been working uh, with the program for five years since it first started back in 2015 and there were only 11 interns. Um, the most recent uh iteration of english camp we had over 200 so it's grown quite a bit and jordan was there uh, for a big part of that growth um, and also jordan was our first official leader of a program it was his first year but being with his experience in japan i worked with him before the 2016 program to get that set up so really exciting and, and of course now zane has also been a leader in the camp and we've had many returnees over each year, this, this last year, we had over 50 returning interns signed up. So that's a big part of our program, as you can probably tell. Um, anyways, thanks again for uh, joining this camp. We just started marketing the English camp. So you guys are the first people to, to hear a little bit about it. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to let Jordan introduce himself briefly. And if you could, please explain, if you can contain it under 10 minutes, your journey uh, with, with Japan in general and including our program. Yeah, sure. So, um, hello to everybody. Uh, as Matt said, my name is Jordan Roth, uh, R-O-T-H. And basically, I've been living in Japan for the last four years or so. And my first summer with Global English Camp was back in 2016. Um, Global English Camp was, I think it was the third time I ever came out to Japan. It was like the third consecutive summer I spent here because I originally came here as an undergraduate. Um, I was doing like sort of a study abroad program 
in 2014, 2015. I graduated from undergrad in 2016 and joined up with English camp. Um, and I actually, that fall of 2016 was starting my graduate program here in Tokyo. So I did English camp for the first time as sort of a lead in as the first few months after I'd officially moved here and then I started grad school. So I did graduate school at Waseda University uh, here in Tokyo for a couple of years, got my master's, um, was studying Japanese politics, uh, to put it you know, in brief terms. And after that, I ended up applying for a language program at a place called the IUC, which is the Inner University Center in Yokohama. Um, it's a pretty well-renowned like language institute that's administered by Stanford um, and like a cons consortium of other universities, including the University of Michigan, where I did my undergrad degree. And uh, I was lucky to get accepted to that. That was another year. And through that, having improved my language skills and through connections and opportunities made available to me um, there, I ended up getting a job, uh, which I've been at for the last more than a year. Um, and what I currently do is I work at a PR firm here in Tokyo. So I handle sort of uh, bilingual relations for both Japanese clients and foreign clients. Um, when it's a foreign client and they want to come to Japan to do business here, or they have some interest in the Japanese market, uh, we help them engage with Japanese journalists and Japanese partner companies. Uh, we help them translate their press releases and sort of do the same thing for Japanese clients when they want to engage overseas. Um, it's a pretty cool job, and it definitely wouldn't have been possible for me to enter into that industry without the experience um, I had in Japan prior. And a big part of that was Global English Camp. Um, I'll be honest and say that Global English Camp wasn't something that changed my life, but it was something that was really awesome, and it helped me engage further with Japanese society. I had a lot of awesome experiences here. Uh, I met a lot of awesome people. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess through the connections I made and memories I made, it did change my life. Um, just not in like this super melodramatic way, but it, it's been pretty significant for me. And I look back fondly. I, I wish I could have done more than three summers, but, you know, it was time to get a real full time job and all that lame stuff. So, yeah. Why did you have to do that lame stuff? We wanted you for another year. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I, something about making money and paying bills. <laughs> And we'll get to that. We'll get to paying bills in Tokyo and your current current life there. But we'll talk about English camp first. And and yeah, as Jordan said, you know, you you're one of the it's it's more rare in our English camp where you are on track to study there, to uh, live there and work there. You are always going to do that when you're going into to English camp. Right. You're already ready to, to stay in Japan. You, I mean, you were there when you did English camp. You're already studying there. Um, but just to let everyone yeah. know real quick he, that's that's listening, most of our our interns are are not necessarily focused primarily on living in Japan or working in Japan. Uh, in fact, most of them are not studying Japanese. Um, and that was a big question, so I'll answer it right, right at the start. You don't need it. Um, but Jordan is one of those rare people that uh, is quite fluent. And if I may say so, you you are quite good and have helped me many a times at restaurants order what I want. <laughs> but uh yeah but you get by man you get by i i try but uh so yeah just for everyone listening it, it not everyone is on that track but but anyways in terms of english camp jordan um and we've shared so many great memories as friends and with zane too and, and if there's other alumni here all together uh what were some of your favorite aspects of the english camp just just all around what was most meaningful to you about the experience man so when you say most meaningful the first thing that comes to mind is the interactions with the students. Um, and just to be clear, I'm not, I was never an education major. I've never had a thing for kids. Like, I, you know, I don't love children and, and education, but it's hard to go on a program like this. And, you know, I, I'm sure everyone listening realizes that it, you know, the, the job aspect of the program is you're going to teach, you know, Japanese high school students and middle school students English from Monday through Friday. Um, it ended up being way more rewarding than I could have imagined. Uh, I, I was kind of going to the trip looking at it the way that I think a lot of other people were, because you know we're college students at the time. We're like, this is basically a free trip to Japan. We just have to do the job aspect and then we can go party and stuff like that. You know, you do get all the free time, but the Monday through Friday nine to five was way more rewarding than I expected it to be. Uh, a lot of these kids are super shy. 
they have varying degrees of interest in English. Some of them are really excited. Some of them are not at all. And ironically enough, some of those less interested kids be ended up being like one of the main reasons that it was so rewarding. Cause I don't know, this is just such a unique experience for them to get to interact with like Western college age uh, individuals. And it, it was just so cool to see some of their attitudes totally turn around. And then even for the kids who were super interested from the beginning and they were really excited to learn English, you know, that, that never got old. It, it, it was so weird at times to realize that just by, you know, having patience and conversing in your native tongue with some of these students, they, they got so much out of it. And yeah, I really enjoyed that aspect, but outside of the classroom, I mean, some of the most memorable things are just, we had a lot of great trips that we took, you know, at the beginning and the end of the program and sometimes intermittently throughout, you know, Brian, who's the program head and Matt, you know, who's on the, on the <laughs> webinar right now, they do a lot of work to, you know, take us to cool places. Like everything's optional. You, that's another awesome, awesome thing about the program is you get a lot of free time and your time outside the classroom is really your own. It's not one of those things you go on where there's all these other, um, like extraneous responsibilities. You just have to show up from, you know, whatever it is, nine to five, Monday through Friday, to do the teaching. And then the rest of your time is your own weekends, whatever. But if you are interested in engaging with the wider community of people that show up, we had so many fun camping trips. And then everyone's also organizing their own things with the smaller groups of friends that they, that they form. So just exploring the city also, because I was still pretty new to Tokyo my first summer. Um, that was great. Yeah, I would have to dig deeper to think of like specific instances, but I think one of the more specific trips that I really loved was Yamanakako, that first summer that I joined in 2016. Yeah, yeah that was um, this lake that we all went to near Fuji, uh, near Mount Fuji. And, you know, we stayed in like a cabin type place for the night and doing stuff like that was really worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah, that was a that was really memorable and what and our first like big trip of the program and since then we've we've changed venues to Hakone which is also near Mount Fuji and we do an, a retreat there after the week of training that's really fun for everyone to relax and and celebrate that you're now prepared to teach students for for 5 weeks. Although I will say that and I think Jordan and Zane can agree that the first week of teaching is the real training when you really jump in with your first group of students. Um, and, yeah. and like Jordan was talking about, get that fulfillment from teaching them and mentoring them uh, for the week. Um, and, and yeah, so talking about the events outside of class, we also have Japanese language classes for people that are interested too. Um, Jordan, did you have a favorite venue that you taught at? Um, or, or I could also say that Jordan um, was the leader of, of venues uh, around Japan as well. So he and Zane did this last year as well. We're, we're interns actually lead the classroom um, with the, the new interns. So it's really a cool commu another community building thing. But Jordan, did you have a favorite venue that you taught at in Japan? Um, the Shinjuku venue, like at the main Toshin building was always really fun because at least during the years that I joined with the program size that we had those years, that was usually the venue where everyone was together. It was a big venue and it facilitated like multiple levels of classrooms. So everyone could kind of meet up, even if you weren't teaching in the same room as someone else that you met on the program. Like lunchtime was always a fun adventure because there's all these awesome restaurants in that area of the city and everyone would kind of meet back up for lunch and then go back to their second half of the day. Um, but besides that larger venue, most of the venues I think that people end up teaching at now are you know, scattered throughout Japan. And they usually end up being um, not like this big uh, building that belongs to Toshin, which is the education company that you guys partner with, but actual schools. So some of the other smaller venues I did, um, there was a place in Yokohama that was really awesome. Um, the guy who was sort of the head of the school who became like our liaison program coordinator uh, for anyone who was working at that venue, he was a really eccentric character and he was really passionate about, you know, getting his students to learn English and improve their conversational ability. So he would always put on these crazy like lunchtime dance karaoke <laughs> parties. And, you know, again, honestly speaking, that was not something that excited me. I was uh, a little bit apathetic going into that the first day teaching there because I was like, dude, I just want to enjoy my lunch hour. Like, don't make me do this. But it was really fun. It, it kind of goes hand in hand with what I was trying to say earlier about how surprisingly rewarding. Um, the teaching in general was because yeah, the kids just got a lot out of it. 
Um, one more that I'll mention is it was also in Yokohama, but a different part of Yokohama. It was Nishi, Yokohama. So like farther from Tokyo, more out in the boondocks. And it was an all boys school. And I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, it's like Seito Gakuen or something. Seiko Gakuen. Yeah. Yeah. Seiko Gakuen. Like that was cool because that was an all boys venue and we had female, uh, interns teaching. Um, and I don't know, like these kids were just so shy. Like, I think I mentioned this earlier, but Japanese middle school and high school students can be so like painfully shy. And these were all boys and they just, they looked so scared the first day. And then especially thanks to the female interns we had there, I think they were having a lot of fun with the fact that these kids didn't often get to interact with the opposite sex. Like we just, they really came out of their shell during that week. And, you know, they were sad to see us go at the end and it was a great time. Yeah. Yeah. And I asked that question because we have so many different experiences of interns. Zane traveled around parts of to different parts of Tokyo. We have venues as, as far south as, as Okinawa, which only had maybe four interns there last summer teaching a smaller class, whereas the Shinjuku one that, that Jordan was talking about, which is right next to Shinjuku Station, I mean, right in the heart of downtown. And, and like Jordan said, lots of good food options there. And we could do a whole oh, webinar on food in Shinjuku. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and, and so, and as far North as, you know, in, up in Hokkaido. And so I think someone asked that question. Yes, we do have venues in Hokkaido multiple. And so how it works just to briefly explain is, is we'll take everyone's preference of, of where they want to be. Do you want to travel a lot? Um, or do you want a home base in Tokyo? So Jordan was one of our leaders kind of home based in Tokyo and Yokohama. Um, or do you want a home base in Kansai? Cause you're interested in going to Kyoto and Osaka. Or are you up for everything, which one of our interns, Schwen, dubbed the carry-on crew, because you're always traveling week to week to a new venue and got to see different parts of Japan, um, which is wild and maybe exhausting for some because it's a new weekend, you know, weekend in a new place, but it's also really special. So there's all these different uh, opportunities in our program to experience Japan, and that's, that's why I asked Jordan, because that was, that was his experience. And, and in our next series, we'll talk about um, different experiences. The last question about English Camp Jordan I know it was me. I know the answer was all and only me, but why did you return to English camp multiple years? <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, I'll try to find a good answer to that, but actually it reminds me of something I wanted to bring up earlier, Go ahead. uh, which is related, which is that I almost didn't join the first summer. Like, uh, I, I mentioned that I was doing my first summer of English camp in 2016, sort of in between finishing undergrad and starting my graduate degree in Tokyo. So that was already decided that I was moving here. And I remember when I got the scholarship to do the graduate degree out here, my Japanese language professor from University of Michigan was like, oh, well, if you're going to live in Japan, like you need to dedicate this summer to just buckling down and doing intensive Japanese. Like, uh, so she convinced me that that was really what I needed to do. And I remember, I don't know if you know this, Matt, but I sent an email to either you and Brian or just Brian. And I was like, I'm really sorry. Cause I was already signed on to be like a program leader this first summer. Yep. And I was like, I'm really sorry, but, you know, it turns out that I'm actually going to be living in Japan doing this degree and I really need to study Japanese. So I, I can't join the program anymore. <laughs> and then, uh, I got a reply from Brian, like within 24 hours. And by the time he sent me the email saying, like, are you sure? Because we think this could be an awesome opportunity for you, too. I'd already thought about it more. And I was like, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I don't need to do this intensive Japanese study all summer. Like, I want to go do this program. It sounds awesome. Um, and it was awesome. And I made the right decision. Uh, I ended up buckling down and studying more Japanese after I got here and started my degree and more so later before starting my job. But um, I, I look back and I know that I made the right decision because the first summer, we only had 60 people in the program. Mm -hmm. It was a lot more contained. I think your, your first summer in 2015, Matt, when the program started was like 15 people. 11, yeah. 11. Okay. So it blew up to 60 um, by the time I joined. And that was really fun because that was like not too small, not too big. There were enough people to like, you know, make sure that you found some cool people to hang out with that were on your wavelength. Um, and but you still kind of knew everybody. By my second summer, after I'd had such a good time and decided to come back, uh, we'd blown up to like 100. And that was still manageable. The third summer I was there in 2018, I think we got close to 200. And it was it was like some craziness. The summer still went great and I had a good time, but um, 
each summer, besides the overall size of the program expanding, a lot of returnees came. And I think they came back for the same reason I did, which is, um, for one, you end up having so much fun because you literally can't not have fun. I don't know. Maybe that's too many negative statements. But <laughs> what I'm trying to say is you really just have to stay committed to like what the program is asking you to do, which is just the teaching aspect. And it, you get all this free time to do whatever you want. And like Matt was talking about, you also get all this time to travel if you want to. You could stay based in Tokyo if that's your prerogative, if you're really just interested in like the capital city. But I mean, I've had so many awesome opportunities to travel this country. And I see a lot of people that have come on the program and they want to be bouncing around every week. You really just get a lot of freedom to engage with the culture on your own terms. And I, I think that's awesome. Like they treat you like adults, which you are. Um, yeah, it, it's perfect. Because I, I had some other experiences as an undergrad where I did like some community outreach type programs, even internationally outside of Japan um, during my summers. And I had at least one nightmare experience. So come on out and English camp kind of was a really stark contrast to those other programs I had experiences with. Yeah, and we appreciate all your contributions so much. And Zane and anyone else here that are looking to come back, always happy to, to welcome people back. And now, since the program has grown to talk about that, and it'll be in the low 200s next year, if, of course, pending the program happens, um, and 50 of those are, are returning interns or so, 40 or 50, just because we get so many people wanting to return. So we do have to offer those spots up. And they help run the program, too. It's, it's very much intern run. Jordan ran it with me. Zane ran it with me. So... Um, yeah, that is, that is a big part, again, that community feeling. But just to add to anyone who's wondering, we do separate it into groups. So we have group A and group B. One group comes out a week earlier. So you may not see half the program, even though you'll be training in the Shinjuku venue and the other group will be teaching there. Uh, and then you'll be put into groups of like 10 to 12. Um, and those are your main groups that you'll travel around. I think Zane took a group of 10 around Tokyo, different parts of Northern Tokyo. Jordan, like he said, had his group in Yokohama. And, and some people are traveling around all over. So you do kind of have this group you bond with throughout, but there's of course opportunities to meet others. And that's, that's so important to us. And again, why we're doing this alumni series. Um, I wanna jump uh, to your time studying there and living in Japan. And again, for those of you who have English camp questions, you can always add to them to the chat if they pop up. Otherwise, uh, we will use your questions from the, the webinar form to, to create a question list. And of course, you can email me, my, my email's in the chat. Uh, and of course attend our next uh, info session. But Jordan, you were talking about how you almost didn't do the program, which I can't even think of that if that happened. <laughs> Not knowing <laughs> I would have missed out. Yeah, man. Uh, and um, so, but yeah, you were doing grad school at the same time. And one of the questions we actually got, actually a few people asked this question, is can you do grad school or, or, or study abroad there during the program or around the program? Um, mm. And uh, I wonder if you could talk about a bit about your grad school experience and, and then, and of course, how it worked out with coming out for you. Yeah. So the first summer I joined up in 2016, I think the scheduling worked out perfectly. You know, once I decided that I wasn't going to stay in Michigan and right. buckle down on Japanese, I wanted to get out there and do the program. Um, I think it worked out perfectly because whatever, like five or six weeks the program took up were perfectly in between, you know, finishing undergrad and starting up my uh, graduate program in Tokyo. But then the following summer, I was in between like uh, terms, like in between years, I'd finished my first, uh, my first year of grad school. And then I think there was some overlap, like my final exams or interviews or something like that were kind of overlapping with the beginning of the program. But I'm pretty sure we figured it out just by, you know, you and Bill and Brian being flexible with me and accepting that I had some lingering responsibilities to finish up. So I guess the answer to that question kind of lies in, you know, what your dates are that you're trying to work around. If you have other commitments with school or work or whatever, um, it's my experience that, you know, the program and the people who lead it will be flexible with you to a reasonable degree. You know, you just can't be, especially now with like, 200 or so people coming in, you know, one of the issues I remember as the program grew over the years is sometimes people have unreasonable uh, requests or demands and they don't understand that, you know, if, if special accommodations are being made for everyone, that gets kind of rough. But 
as long as you're willing to be flexible too, I'm sure things can get worked out. Yeah. And a lot of people do do the program and then jump right into studying abroad or uh, jump into JET, the JET program. If I'm sure many of you are interested. I got a few questions on that, which uh, Jordan didn't do, uh, but we have other alumni that, that have done it. And, and we can have them share their experiences later. Uh, the JET program, for, for the person who just asked, is a, a one year, I think it's a contractual one year teaching assignment with the government of Japan. And you basically are assigned an English teaching assistant uh, somewhere in the country. You kind of list your preferences just like our program and then you get assigned. But it's a, for a full year and it's a full time job. Um, and uh, you, you kind of don't have as much control over where you are. Uh, or where you're placed rather. Uh, but I've heard it's a great experience and a lot of people, I mentioned it because some people asked about it in the in the forum, but a lot of people do use Come On Out Japan as like a test if they really enjoy teaching English in Japan because our program is only five weeks, then you can see if you want to do a full year the JET. But Jordan, on the other hand, stuck around, did school and is living there. And one of the main questions we got, um, which is, is very broad and I'm sure you've, you've had uh, multiple experiences, uh, but everyone bear in mind that Jordan, of course, speaks Japanese quite well. Uh, but what were some of the main challenges you had um, in adapting to living in Japan? Yeah, um, man, it's it's almost weird to think about now because I feel so at home here. I've been here for yeah. four years, which is not like a super long time, but I've felt for a while now already that Japan is like my home. Um, but I remember after I officially moved here in 2016 and after I finished the program and was sort of adjusting to my new daily life as like a full-time student, um, the culture shock hit me in sort of a latent way. Like I'd, as I mentioned earlier, I'd spent time here in the summers of 2014, 2015, and now I just finished my summer of 2016 and was settling into like, okay, this is my new normal. This is where I live now. And my Japanese, despite the amount that I'd studied, was still not like, I didn't feel conversationally proficient because I, I just hadn't been actually living here for a while. And textbook Japanese is not the same as everyday Japanese. And yeah. I guess just not feeling like I was able to express myself as casually or effectively as I could in my native tongue, it slowly started to build on me. Um, I didn't ever have any like major meltdown or anything, but I, just, I definitely had a few months um, within my first year here where I just, you know, felt like a little bit homesick and some culture shock. Like I would be on the train and I would feel like hyper aware about Japanese people looking at me because I'm a foreigner and, uh, you know, full disclosure, like I have tattoos on my arms and sometimes my beard is longer. And these are just sort of like little, uh, superficial things that can draw more attention. Like if you're not Japanese and you're in Japan, you're always going to be an object in a sense, you know, you're foreign. And I obviously don't have as much experience with that um, as, you know, other people I've spent time with here or in general, like I, I've never had to deal with being objectified um, in terms of like being African American, for example, like they can get, you know, black people in Japan can get even more undue attention in a superficial way or just, any like non-white foreigner. Sometimes as a white person in Japan, I feel like even though there's instances where I'm being somehow objectified for being non-Japanese, I'm getting like the uh, more convenient end of it because some people, you know, they just think like, oh, you look like this Hollywood star or something. Anyways, I'm kind of well, getting do. off. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but um, I'm kind of getting out into the weeds. But I guess like there are these weird superficial moments where you're just you're going to be constantly reminded that you're not Japanese but if you're okay with that I mean I don't think anyone's going to come out here thinking that being here makes them Japanese or that they won't get this sort of undue attention um like you can have a great time I I'm saying that this sort of slowly built on me and I would notice little things and it affected me after I'd spent quite a while here but uh, for example my first summer with the program it was a short term thing, you know, it's like five or six weeks, had a great time. Uh, there's no expectation of being able to speak Japanese anyway. So I guess this is more for the people who might be considering living here long term. And I guess the piece of advice that I could offer um, to cope with things like this that will probably inevitably happen to you, unless you're already super fluent is just try to get better at the language and, you know, take learning the language seriously, because if you're living anywhere, 
uh, where the native tongue is not your own, you should be, you know, doing that due diligence and trying to get better so that you can engage more honestly and effectively with the people around you. And they'll appreciate that. And, you know, then you can get a better understanding of who they are and you'll just have a more genuine experience within the culture. Yeah, that's, that's a great advice and, and a great answer. And and actually, just to touch on that from a Global English Camp standpoint, one of the main responsibilities of our leaders, of our returnees, are to help people make feel comfortable since they have done they have experienced this program and and in in all sorts of ways and living in Japan for a summer and not to mention that we have our partners come on up the staff there and the Toshin staff that are in the classroom that more than anything just want to take you to their favorite spots and and make you feel comfortable that omotenashi spirit which means you know that welcoming atmosphere in in Japan and that's a huge really special part of the program it's not just the community of our interns and our leaders and and returning interns um, but also the Toshin, the Japanese staff um, that really make you feel welcome and, and make your experience really special. Um, and, and Jordan, going back to the language, I had a real, this is a quick fire question for you because I got a few questions on the language skills needed to survive in Japan. And I thought this one was interesting. What level of Japanese is needed to functionally live day to day? And how long might it take to get there from no Japanese? <laughs> Man, yeah, it's just so hard. Like, it's kind of a subjective question. It depends on, like, what you define oh, yeah. as, like, really necessary. And I will say this. Um, before I felt proficient at Japanese, whatever you take that to mean, I still felt like I was able to get along here. Now, when it came to, like, my first week actually living in my apartment in Tokyo, I felt a little bit overwhelmed not yet being proficient uh, because there were all these logistical things to take care of. I had to, like, get my utilities turned on and register at city hall. And like, you know, sometimes I was getting mail where it's like, I can't read this. And um, those things are no longer an issue, but they were definitely stressful at the time. And weirdly enough, I'm almost embarrassed to say that I know people that have been living here for a matter of years, even up to a decade, who never really took learning the language seriously. There is like, if you want to be one of these people, you can live in the expat bubble here. Um, I personally don't have it's hard for me to understand why or how you'd ever want to remain in that bubble, but it's possible. So I think even with like virtually no Japanese, you can make it work. But like I was trying to say earlier, the more you take learning the language seriously, just exponentially your experience here will be that much more genuine and enjoyable. Yeah. And, and I really wanted to hear that from you, but if, if any of you want to hear more about learning Japanese and you know, the importance of it while living there, for those of you who want to, move there and live and work there. We have another webinar uh, on our website with Bill, who is a, a, a staff on Toshin, but he's from, he's from Oregon in the United States. And he talks about transitioning to life there. He's lived there for some time now and, and talks about the same thing Jordan just did. So if you want to learn more, definitely check that out. Um, and then uh, Jordan, um, as far as other things and working and living, do you have any advice for people apart from language, I guess, that want to live and find a job there maybe i mean obviously you can't speak to every you know job like the teaching english which you know you did for us but not at, at a professional level um but yeah do you have any general advice that people that want to move up out there and find something um yeah you know i can recommend some specific avenues that helped me out uh in getting here and like making a life here i would say for example if you're a student and you're interested in just trying out life in Japan, so to speak. Um, obviously, you can look into programs like this one, which are awesome. I had a great time on Come On Out. You know, you get to come out for five weeks uh, during your summertime and basically have expenses paid for. You just got to teach, like, so you do a job short term. Um, if you're interested in maybe even doing like a more long term study abroad, uh, you mean know, my university offered opportunities for that. So I would say look into whoever handles like study abroad opportunities at your university. Um, if you're not aware immediately of any connections with Japan or Japanese universities, just find out who's in charge of that and make sure they don't exist because they probably do, at least if you go to like a bigger school, um, but it depends. Besides that, Matt mentioned the JET program. That's worth looking into. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with the JET program, think of it as like, you know, a Teach for America meets Peace Corps kind of thing, but you know, it is education focused. It's a more long-term commitment for a year, but that's worth looking into. You can also look into some of the uh, more like private companies that take 
students or workers from places like the United States to come and teach in Japan. Um, some of them are like Eon, A-E-O-N, um, man, ECC, I think is another one. Uh, Berlitz, B-E-R-L-I-T-Z. There's a lot of companies like that. Um, also, I would recommend looking into the Inner University Center, the IUC, which is where I did my language fellowship after grad school. And then finally, another one I would mention is um, the foundation that gave me the scholarship opportunity to come out here and study in Japan uh, for my master's, which is the Ito Foundation. It's I-T-O. And, you know, some of these foundations and opportunities are only available to people from specific universities because they're uh, sponsored or funded or administered by specific consortiums of um, Western universities. But some of them will take almost anyone who is a Western college student or has a degree. Uh, you know, the requirements, they vary. So just look into opportunities like that. Um, I hope that was a decent answer. Yeah, that was helpful. And those are a lot of good companies. And and for anyone that uh, didn't write that down, uh, you have my email, reach out. Um, our newsletter often provides resources like that and, and different jobs. And we're working on getting more partnerships in Japan to find in other internships apart from our program. Because one of our main things is we really want to help people find that opportunity in Japan. But we're still small, we're still growing. Uh, and we get tons of applications. That's why, again, everyone here, my big reminder, apply early. <laughs> we accept oh, on, go ahead, George. Yeah, sorry to cut, uh, cut you off, Matt. I just wanted to mention one more big one that, you know, for anyone interested, they should definitely check out is the MEXT scholarship, oh, yes. M-E-X-T. Um, so Monbu Kagakusho, it's like the education wing of the Japanese government. They sponsor it. It's a great scholarship opportunity. So that's definitely worth looking into also. And actually that reminded me as well. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, the MEXT is huge. Uh, and if you go to our website, uh, our a recent blog was written by our intern, Sara, and she details the, the process to applying to schools. Um, it's really, really helpful. She did a ton of research, and a big part of that, that article, the blog post, is about MEXT and how to do that. So um, while Jordan can be very helpful here, it's all written out for you. Go check out the blog if you're interested in studying abroad or I mean, studying abroad part-time or going to graduate school like Jordan did full-time and the different options there and, and scholarships. Um, so yeah, thanks for reminding me on that too, uh, Jordan. And so, sure. and so yeah, that's, uh, you know, and, and a lot of our English camp alumni, do, uh, you know, try to find these experiences as well. So um, we always try to share that, not just in these webinars that we're starting, but on our newsletter. So yeah, please check it out and, and don't hesitate to to email me with any questions, even though I haven't studied abroad there like Jordan, and I don't currently live and work there. I should have said I'm in Los Angeles right now. Actually, we've got three time zones here with Jordan in Japan and Zane in the UK. Uh, but but yeah, we have an expansive alumni network, and and, and uh, if you do do the program, there's that's going to be available to you, and you meet so many people with different interests and, and different passions and, and learn from them and, and get tips like this that Jordan's giving us uh, here. And, uh, and, and one more question about living in Japan, since you, we haven't touched on this yet, is um, how was it in finding a place to actually live in Japan? Yeah, so for me, I got kind of lucky at the beginning because um, <clears throat> Waseda University, which is uh, the university I did my master's at and you know moved out here to do, they had a department for like uh, international students looking for places to you know, live. Uh, they had dorms and stuff, but it wasn't a requirement to stay in the dorms and I didn't want to stay in the dorms. So I reached out to that department and they helped me find uh, a management company and apartment building. They helped me, you know, get contracts signed. So that was really helpful, but not everyone will necessarily have that, uh, you know, that convenient of a time. Yeah, right. I don't know if every university has a department like that. And if you're not coming out here for school, if you're coming out here for work, uh, you know, maybe your employer or whoever's contracting you will help you find accommodations. I think that is common, but if if not, um, man, yeah, I guess when I moved into my second apartment, I just happened to know someone who had a family member working as a uh, real estate agent here. There's definitely a lot of services, uh, even for people who don't speak Japanese, to find housing accommodations. One company I know of in particular is called GTN. Uh, global something network, but they specifically market themselves to foreigners uh, and foreigners who want to find apartments in Tokyo. There's got to be other similar services throughout Japan. 
So they exist. Uh, this also is helpful in regards to the last question about like finding job opportunities or opportunities to teach. Uh, there's online forums too. You know, there's websites like Gaijinpot. It's G-A-I-J-I-N-P-O-T. Um, there is a huge Facebook group called TEN10, Tokyo Expat Network. Uh, I think one of the main requirements or maybe the only requirement is that you are currently living in Tokyo or plan to move here. Um, they don't really check up on it, but it, it's a big online community of people that are always posting like opportunities for work and, you know, or like a new restaurant that opened. It's just stuff like that. So even if you don't speak the language, or you're moving here for the first time, there's definitely avenues for you. I guess if you weren't going to Waseda University where I studied and you didn't speak the language well, one of the first things I'd recommend looking at would be that company I mentioned, GTN. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, a few people asked that as well. And, and just to throw it out there, since they're our partner company, come on up. We, when you guys come to Japan, especially if you're living in a big city, you would live in a share house. And share house companies are, are popular in Japan, or at least more popular than they are in the States, as far as I know. Um, and you would be living in a room in a, in a house, um, but you'd share the living spaces, the amenities with other roommates. And Come On Up focuses on internationally minded people, you know, global mindset people, people that want to meet people from around the world. So there's a lot of Japanese young professionals that live there or university students that want to talk to you and want to. And, and that's part of our program, too. If you're in Tokyo, you'll probably get placed in a share house and you'll probably have other interns living there with you and you might have an, uh, a, you know, a Japanese recent graduate there too that wants to talk and you have house meetings and fun activities, cooking nights. Um, and just to mention, since this was a big question on a lot of people's, on, on our forum was, uh, if you're not living in a share house, you could do a homestay. Those are in the more rural uh, parts of the country. So if you do end up doing this program and want a homestay, remember right now to make your preference that you are okay traveling to the smaller cities, because that's where you'll get to do a homestay which are, are wonderful and and I know Zane's done one of those and and maybe that'll be our next webinar <laughs> it would be a good one to share your experiences uh, and then we also have um, apartments and and sometimes hotels uh, so the experience it's another way the experience does vary um, is is your housing and and we take the requests of what you need to to feel comfortable seriously as well yeah and I um I should have mentioned you know share houses are not just something that like you'll experience if you go on a, a program or like a teaching assignment in Japan. Uh, share houses are really common as an option, especially for younger people in Japan in general, and not just for international uh, residents, but for Japanese people. Like, it's very common that people in their 20s, 30s, especially will live in share houses. It's a relatively cheap way to live, but there's some really nice ones. I've had great experiences at share houses. Um, you get to meet all kinds of different people. It's usually working professionals and students. But uh, it's a good time if you're okay with like sharing like a living room and bathrooms and stuff. You know, it's it can be great. Absolutely. Um, and and a and a good question that comes up is if you apply with a friend and you want to live together, that is possible. There is a space to request that in our onboarding process to travel together and live together, especially if it's it's something that makes you more comfortable. This has happened in the past a lot, and we want people to enjoy their experiences. So. Of course, we can't guarantee it, but we do take all those requests seriously. Um, and we know a lot of people join up together. And uh, we, we want everyone to meet new people, too, because you're meeting people from around the world. Um, you know, what's so special about this is I can go to Tokyo and, and, and Jordan, I'm looking at you when I get out there next that I can stay at his place. <laughs> of course, man, always. <laughs> and I can go to the UK and see Zane or, or they can come here in L.A. And that's a big big part of it too so um yeah if you do apply with a friend just uh, when it gets to the onboarding process just just put it there don't need to put that in the application uh, just yet anyways for these last 15 minutes um since i'm not since there were about 85 signups for this thing and we've only got what 38 here um i have this huge <laughs> list of questions that people yeah. have but I'd, I'd like to give priority to those who are who are still here um, so if you don't mind, if anyone has any specific questions, especially for Jordan, um, whether it's his experiences in English camp or his time living in Japan or studying there, uh, if you could either type it in the chat or since it's not too crazy, uh, I'd like to have some people, you know, raise their hand and unmute and, and, and say hello. I think that would be that would be nice. And that's a nice part we like to have on our webinars if they're not too big. Um, so does anyone have any any questions? 
and it's hard for me to look at everyone. So just go ahead and unmute if you want to. Yeah, and you can get weird with it. Ask whatever you want. Yeah, this is a good opportunity to to ask any questions about the program or or living in Japan or working there. Oh, Zane's got a question. Let's start us off. Oh, uh, Jordan. Yeah. Tell me about food. Oh man, where to start? Uh, I am a pretty big foodie. Not the kind that, you know, documents every meal and posts about it on Instagram, but just, I love food. It's been a big passion of mine for a long time. Uh, I'm sure the same is true for a lot of you. Um, <sighs> there was a time a couple of years ago when I thought I was going to move back to the States and not stay here to work. And one of the main things that was actually causing me some like temporary minor depression was the thought of leaving the Japanese food scene. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I'm like constantly thinking about the next meal and there's just so much good food here. Uh, there's good like international food, but I really love washoku. Like I love Japanese cuisine. So, you know, I go to like my favorite neighborhood, um, Shokudo, which is kind of like a cafeteria style restaurant in, in my neighborhood almost every day for lunch. And for dinner, I'm always like checking out new restaurants with my girlfriend and friends and uh, I don't think anyone needs to be told that Tokyo is one of the best food cities in the world. I mean, I haven't been to every city, but um, it's got to be the best that I've been to. It's it's definitely the best for me. And you, yeah. you might think Zane asked that in jest, but in all seriousness, it is a huge part of our program. Everyone's recommending food to each other. The staff are taking people out to their favorite restaurants. Uh, Jordan, Zane, and I are taking people out to our favorite restaurants, and it's it's a big passion and, and important part of culture. In well, in I was going to say in Tokyo, but in Japan in general. And uh, Zane even has made a halal friendly map for for interns, which was awesome. We've had people make vegetarian maps, um, which is super important. Um, and, and and also what you need to know in Japanese to order at, at restaurants, um, which which yeah. can be very important. Yeah, yeah I guess. Um, go ahead, Zane. Um, sorry. Um, for people with dietary restrictions or requirements, maybe that be allergies or religious reasons or for anything, it is manageable. We've had lots of interns who can't eat for this or that for whatever reason. And as far as I'm aware, we haven't had any issues with it. Yeah. 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 Um, I think Zach had a question. Do you want to unmute? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do have a question. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to ask Zane what your experience was like. Um, with homestay family how was that yes so i had one week up north in japan in hokkaido kind of uh north and east and so i stayed with um my homestay was a bit unusual in that i stayed with the one of the staff who worked for the program whereas usually you would stay with one of the students who would work for the program and so the idea there being that the, the person that you're staying with acts as your kind of translator and continues to speak English with you as well as Japanese with the family. But in terms of the, the general experience, it was fantastic having to actually live and experience uh, a normal kind of Japanese home and house, um, the traditional kind of breakfasts, um, lunches and dinners. Uh, my homestay mother uh, made me a bento lunch every time. Uh, and so it was just really nice. And you know, you get to warm up to the family quite well. And, you know, uh, on the last day, we went out for a nice big sushi restaurant and it was fantastic. Uh, and I still keep in contact with them as well. Uh, that's one of the things yeah. that happens with the people that you meet on the program, Japanese and Americans, British, everybody. You make really great connections. So fantastic question. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Zach. Thank and, if, and if you end up doing the program, I hope you can do a, a homestay to experience that as well. And. Uh, yeah, I know I've always been envious because I've never done a homestay being staff. I, I would never take a spot from an intern doing <laughs> one of the, have an experience like that. Uh, but yeah, going off of what Zane said too, it's even if you don't get a homestay, just just to say it, uh, like Zane was saying, you make friends with the staff and, and, and local staff, especially that, like I mentioned earlier, want to take you out to their favorite spots. And we've all made friends over the years that we see every year. So when I go back to, to Japan last summer, Jordan wasn't doing the program, but Zane was, and we met up and, and we met up with staff friends that we've made, you know, in our favorite spots. And so that's a really special part of it. Um, yeah. Thanks Zach. Any other 
Any other questions you can raise your hand? Uh, Leah, I think. Go ahead. Hi, um, I was curious kind of about the um, specific teaching. Since we're teaching them um, English, how did you get both Zane and Jordan? How did you guys feel about the language? Was it difficult to go over? How much English did they already like know typically? Jordan, you can answer this because Zane will be at the next webinar anyways. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, sure. I'm sure Zane has some good input on this too, but yeah, for me, um, I don't know if this is still like a mantra that's repeated at English camp, but at least my first year, we kept hearing from the staff, like, don't use any Japanese. Like, even if you know some, it's got to be completely in English. And the English abilities of the students who join the program are pretty varied. Like, sometimes you've got kids who are really into English and they're pretty conversational. And sometimes you've got kids who they can't even tell you what they had for breakfast that morning. Um, so that can provide an extra challenge. But I think the main criteria for success that I saw with interns who got a lot out of the program and made sure that their students they were assigned to got a lot out of it was just patience. And I know that that might sound uh, like cliche or uh, simplistic, but it's true. Another thing that occurred to me was people have different like varied levels of ability in terms of being able to realize how complex the speech they're using is. So one thing we'll talk about is, you know, just try to speak slowly and clearly and in simple language, especially for the students that are, you know, less proficient. And some people would say, okay, got it. And then they would continue to talk to the students like they were talking to their friend who was a native English speaker. It took really like not just patience, but awareness um, to realize when you were using, for example, figurative, figurative speech or uh, an expression that was non-literal. And I think once you began to be able to pay attention to um, the way that your speech came off to someone who's a non-native speaker, things started to sort of progress and uh, both sides started to get a lot more out of the teaching experience. Yeah. Zane, anything to add to that? Great answer, Jordan. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So just to add to that, I found that actually a lot of the Japanese students know more English than they think they do. And I think that's true across most Japanese people, like all over Japan. Uh, so in school, they mostly focus on reading and writing, and they don't have much practice speaking and listening. So they'll come in thinking that they can't speak any, ja uh, speak any English, excuse me. But once you've figuratively cracked their shell and got them to open up, actually, they're fine by day five. The amount of growth you see uh, on the by the fifth day is insane. Yeah, that's uh, Zane. I couldn't put it a couldn't have put it better. On the fifth day, you you realize the transformation, and it's so fulfilling to really see that. And you don't. It's hard to listen to us and and imagine it, but when you actually experience it, it's it's so satisfying and meaningful. So thank you, Leah, for that question. Um, and hope oh, thank you, you to, guys. Yeah, hope you get to enjoy uh, that that teaching experience. It's it's so rewarding. Uh, I think next question that raised their hand was uh, Ryan. Hi, um, I just wanted to first of all thank you all so much for hosting this. It's really great to hear experiences um, from new perspectives, and I wanted to ask Jordan. Um, I'm not sure if this was addressed earlier, but I'm really interested in what connected you, what drew you to Japan in the first place. Because um, uh, I also remember hearing you mention Japanese politics, and I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty unique. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for your question, Ryan. So uh, I'll try to give a very short version of how I got involved with Japan in general. Um, when I was a undergraduate sophomore, I was not having a great time in college. I didn't know what I wanted to study. Um, my mom was worried because I had been talking about dropping out of college. And uh, she kind of found like, she was looking on the department website uh, for the International Studies Department at University of Michigan and saw that there was this class about Japanese literature uh, where if you signed up for like an extension in the summer, you could go to Japan with the professor and get some extra credits and she's like, why don't you do that? You've always been interested in Japan because I kind of grew up doing things like martial arts and, you know, I watched Dragon Ball Z when I was a kid. And it, I think people have a lot of similar uh, sort of childish even reasons for being interested in Japan. 
coming from the West. So uh, long story short, I did that Japanese literature class. I fell in love with contemporary Japanese literature, started reading all these different authors, uh, went to Japan that first time, had an awesome time. And I, I basically knew since that first summer in 2014 that I had to come back. Uh, I didn't yet know or even plan on like living in Japan, but uh, I started focusing my undergraduate uh, career on Japanese studies. I started getting into Japanese politics, Japanese history, and uh, I became an international studies and East Asian studies major focused on Japan. Um, by the time I was graduating and I got the scholarship opportunity to come here for a master's degree, I decided that I wanted to focus on Japanese politics uh, because all this debate surrounding the Japanese constitution was really interesting to me. So that's kind of how I ended up here more practically. Um, I continue to practice martial arts today and that's a big connection culturally as well. So, you know, that's just my story, but I'm sure a lot of you guys have your own reasons. And uh, one more thing that I'll just bring up again is that you get so much freedom on this program. Um, so whatever your interests are outside of the classroom, I had so many good experiences being able to train uh, martial arts here when I wasn't teaching and, you know, meet Japanese people who invited me into their homes, even though I didn't do an actual homestay. Uh, I had that freedom to go and, you know, hang out with people outside the program too, that I met here. So I hope that answered your question. And it was a that great, was really insightful. yeah, thank you, Ryan. That was a great question. Actually brings up a, a great point of like, when I first met Jordan and talked about Japanese politics and didn't know much at all, at all about that. And, and you learn not only everyone's different passions, which by the way, you present upon in the English camp to the students, you present about your passion, your life mission, what you wanna do and the students learn from you. And it's a, another great way to connect with them uh, and, and learn from other interns. Uh, but you also get to share your love and, and, and learning process, uh, or sorry, uh, learning about Japan while there. And so you get, you know, you get to learn everyone's interests and why they're there. And I think that's, that's so cool. Um, next question I think was Janet. Yeah. Um, so I know we already touched on like the housing part of it, but just like thinking like logistically, like what are the costs, like if we do end up doing the program to like look towards or like think about ahead? Yeah. Great question, Jenna, and really important one. Uh, Jordan and Zane, you both want to talk a little bit about costs that you kind of ran into while, while doing the program? Uh, Zane, you can go ahead and take this one if you want. Okay. Uh, so everybody's experience will be very different. Um, so if I'm correct, you still get a stipend based off of um, the work that you do. And that is usually enough to cover um, your food. And travel is also, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's uh, refunded, basically. Yeah. Um, so effectively, you could um, not spend a penny, basically, uh, throughout the program. And there are ways to um, visit like free museums, and go to free parks and do lots of different things where you don't spend any money. Um, but for me personally, I found that I was going to go in with a bunch, you know, I saved up some money from before the program because I knew that I wanted to really make the most of the experience. And, you know, if I was going to spend, I was going to spend. <laughs> so that was my, my experience. Yeah. I went in the same mentality and, uh, food being a big part of it if we want to bring it back to food but with the food stipend I, I will say and a lot of interns have done this it's really uh, you can definitely budget it uh, with about 25 us dollars a day um you, there is you know the best bowl of ramen you ever had for five dollars um you know the the food there it's kind of a misconception i think about japan or at least i had before going is that all food was expensive there the sushi etc just from what I'm used to in Los Angeles, but no, it's very affordable and very high quality. So you can, you can definitely get by with that stipend and save it for the weekends. Uh, but if you're like Zane and Jordan and I, you'll probably want to spend a bit more to, to have some extravagant meals as well. Um, and with that, before I go to the next question, Jordan, I'm, I'm going to release you of your duties uh, since you've done this full hour on your Saturday morning, which I really appreciate. Um, yeah, no worries. Um, Man, I love you, Matt. So I was willing to do this. Love you too. Even when I, I, I thought there was going to be like, you know, five people joining this. So it's really cool to see the turnout you got. Um, I just want to say before I go, you know, thanks for listening to me ramble on. And if anybody has any more specific questions for me about my time in the program or just about Japan in general, because, you know, I'm actually not officially affiliated with Come On Out anymore. I'm just doing this because I love Matt and Zane. And um, I know that I can help answer some of your guys' questions. Let me know. Uh, I'll tell you guys my email in case it, you know, interest anybody if they have further questions so 
Uh, you can reach me at j.roth, R-O-T-H, at Ashton, A-S-H-T-O-N, dot J-P, or just ask Matt for my contact info, <laughs> but uh, I'd be glad to answer more questions. So thanks, guys, and uh, hopefully meet some in person sometime. Yeah, we'll thank you so now. much, Jordan. Really appreciate you sharing your contact and, and, and giving some awesome advice to everyone. So thank you. And I'll stick around for the next 15 minutes to answer questions too, but enjoy your weekend, my friend. I hope I get to see you soon. For sure. Everybody stay safe. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, Jordan. Thanks, Jordan. And so with that, yeah, we'll move. And, and Ryan says, you don't mean live off cal calorie mate bars, do you? Uh, for those of you who don't know that, uh, <laughs> they are, I don't need to explain them. You can look them up for yourself, but I actually think they're pretty good. But actually speaking on that, the convenience store food that is super cheap is actually really good. I think, I think, uh, and, and you can find those at convenience stores. But Ryan, no, I don't mean that with the $25 a day <laughs> stipends. Uh, but I definitely sent a calorie mate bar and a gift package we had on, uh, for a winner of our Instagram photo contest in case you guys follow us and saw that. Um, anyways, let's move on to some questions. We've got some time. And, and Zane, I know it's 2 a or what is it, 3 a.m. for you? It is 3 a.m. in London. This is the kind of passion we have from our team. <laughs> Zane, you can tell Zane's got the shirt. We've got it up here. I've got it up here too. Uh, but let's see the next question. Um, Janet, did you have another question? Or is Maybe the hand's still raised. Let's go to uh, Max and then Irie and then Zach and, and back to Janet if you had another one. So, so Max, what was your question? Uh, Max, are you there? Do you have a question? I think you raised Hello? your hand. Hey, yeah, we can hear Hello? you. I'm here? Okay. Hello. Um, so with regards to the logistics of uh, applying, um, on the application site, um, it talks about how you don't really need the or the the English certificates the TEFL and, and the other one um, are not required uh, could you give uh, you know I don't know an estimate of like how many non certificate holders actually get in 90% um, of the program are non certificate holders it's not oh, all okay. yeah so Max we, we put that there because of course you know if it's a program mentoring students and teaching English of course having that experience helps because that means you're obviously passionate about teaching English, or maybe you've had experience doing that before, and the certificate's a great way to do that. And, and of course, if you're looking for an e English teaching job abroad afterwards, for example, working in Japan, uh, again, Jordan doesn't teach English, but uh, for other alumni that do, you definitely need the TEFL to teach there. For our program, do not need it. In fact, we, we wanna have a wide variety of candidates. So um, we do put it there because, of course, teaching experience does help your application because and a, and a passion for teaching because that's what you're going to be doing for five weeks uh, with students. But of course, we do a one week of training uh, where we prepare you guys. And of course, we want people with different interests, too. We don't want just in English majors. We don't want just education majors. We don't want just Japanese majors. We want everyone. Zane's a math major. Uh, I studied film and linguistics and anthropology. We, we, everyone, Jordan studied, well, of course, you already know international studies. So there's, we, we want a wide variety and we just put that on there just to, you know, let people know that, of course, we, we do consider teaching English uh, or English experience or passion for English super important. I see. That's really great to hear. And if, if you don't mind, can I get uh, one more uh, quick question? Go ahead. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, you, earlier, you mentioned, Matt, that um, there's uh, something about early application that you really want to be on that. Uh, could you, I, I didn't quite hear that. Could you uh, reiterate that? Yeah, of course. Sorry, I had to get a drink of water there. Um, I will put in the, the chat um, real quick the, the link. Um, but if you go to our Global English Camp page on, on, on our website, uh, and go to the apply you can see the different deadlines so we have different phases basically and we what we why we've done that is because and i think someone asked this in the chat we about how many uh, applicants uh, we get and how many do we accept so all, that's kind of relevant to be honest we get a, over a thousand every year we we do get a ton of applications and um we love that we love the enthusiasm uh, but we're really bummed that we can only set, accept 20% of them. And, and honestly, it's a little bit less because of the returning interns, because that's such an important part of our program. But, but don't you know, let that scare you off. If you apply before our early phase, which ends November 30th this year, we actually extended it because, of course, everything's going to be delayed this year. Um, it gives you a much, it honestly does give you a much better chance because we 
hire people on a rolling basis. So once November 30th hits, or actually even before that, I'll be checking out applications. Uh, we'll start contacting people for, for interviews. Um, I think in our application, it says 45 days. We, it used to be 30 days, but again, everything's going to be delayed. Um, and if we interview you and you're great, we pass you on to our team in Japan for the second interview. And if they interview you, you're great. You're accepted just like that. So it, I mean, just like that, it takes time, of course, but for the, the different interviews, but it's not like we're waiting to, you know, wait for more applicants. We hire like 75% of the people in the first round because, or 75% of our interns that go end up going to Japan, because why not? The, the most enthusiastic people apply earliest and we'd rather get you guys settled in and start the onboarding process sooner rather than later. And so that's kind of been our policy. So that's what I mean by that. Um, so it's based on those phases. So definitely everyone recommend as soon as possible. Uh, but if, you know, I understand school's getting busy for some of you, definitely by November 30th. Can't, can't recommend that enough. All right, fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Max, for the question. Uh, and we got uh, Irie. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, this is kind of a logistical question too. Um, I think no it might be really specific, but I have a Japanese citizenship too, and I was wondering if it matters if I go as a US citizen or if I can also go as a Japanese citizen. We, we have had Japanese citizens uh, attend the program. I think there's some, some things with, uh, that get tricky. I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this having dual citizenship uh, with going to the country for mm -hmm. an unpaid internship. For example, if you go to, for our program, uh, you, know, this is, you, you don't need to get a work visa. We're, it's a tourist visa. You guys can be there for, uh, Zane, I don't remember. Do you remember the total days? It's like three months or something something like that 90 days if 90 I days correctly. yeah and so you know we we recommend looking into that uh with with what's best for you to enter the country because i don't know if you have family there and what and whatnot I, I know it gets tricky with japan and holding multiple passports but as far as our program it doesn't affect it as far as getting into our program doesn't affect it we would work with you to do what's best for you to attend okay thank you thanks for the question yeah i did see yours on the forum so i'm glad you're here to ask that mm -hmm. um and then we have jose yeah, hi. I just mainly wanted to ask about like uh, if, if a work day there is like nine to five ish, what does that work day look like? Yeah, so uh, we get in, uh, we ask everyone to get in at least 30 minutes ahead of time. So 930 actually. And people like Zane, the, the staff and leaders will hold meetings to go over the day. Any concerns kind of get everyone amped up uh, in the morning. Maybe maybe I'll be handing out some natto rolls, which uh, if you don't know what that is, look it up. It's one of my favorite foods, but most people don't like it. So <laughs> I like people to try fermented soybeans in the morning, have some coffee in the, in the, at the venue, and then get to your students by 10 a.m. And then uh, you have many breaks throughout the day, too, to stretch, go to the restroom, um, play games with students. That happens throughout the day. Um, and in fact, at, at most venues, like I said earlier, uh, people like Zane and the leaders are in charge. So our textbook wall we want everyone to follow it and there's some things that are required if some activity is not working you can go play a game and get everyone energized it's pretty lax and, and we want people to be creative and spontaneous too to best support their students anyways and then you have an hour lunch again we encourage people to eat with students um and and talk because they really enjoy that uh, at some venues uh, you go out to lunch with them to their favorite spots um but uh and then as far as the the work end i think zane mentioned this earlier or or jordan um at five, you know, you do a quick review with your team, maybe a quick team meeting if it's needed, then you're off. You can do whatever you like. And we have Japanese classes, we have cultural events going on, but um, they're all optional. Uh, and, and there's also a lot of unofficial stuff going on, team bonding activities, like Zane takes his team out to a place he loves or to a, you know, a, a tourist landmark. Or I'll say, hey, I've got 10 spots at my favorite restaurant. Um, and Zane, you know which one I'm talking about. And uh, first I 10 do. people to message me gets to go because I made a reservation. So there's all this kind of unofficial stuff to him. But again, once it hits the five o'clock, 5.30, when your meeting's done around then, you're good to go. And, and weekends as well, you, you, you are, unless you're traveling to another venue, you have like a plane you have to catch or a Shinkansen, a bullet train, you're up to you, what you do. Awesome, thank Hopefully you. Hopefully that helps, yeah. Thanks for the question, Jose. Um, I think there's a quick question in the chat Erica asked, um, what is the latest date we can accept decline the offer? 
usually it's it's uh, around we we send it out once we start accepting people and usually it's around end of february end of march but to be honest this year uh, we're going to be very lax on that um so we don't want people to even worry about that until you're accepted and we'll talk through it um because obviously we have we're, we're totally uncertain about what's going on and, and, and the health and safety of everyone is is by far the most important so um well, and if you guys saw on our COVID page, go check it out. We follow all these guidelines, of course, and talk with our program sponsors in Japan. Uh, but as far as confirming, uh, Erica, you're not you're not locked in, so to speak, until you buy a plane ticket. Or, I'm sorry, you don't buy it. Uh, you you pay a deposit, and we pay for the rest. Uh, but we wouldn't have you do that if it you know if it wasn't safe. So I imagine, we, while well, we don't have an exact date, it's going to be much later in, in the play by year when it comes to spring. Thank you, Erica. Oh, yeah. And, and we have a lot of people that are figuring out their grad school. And that actually determines whether you're in group A or group B, if you have jobs and need to get home earlier or need to leave later. That's how we determine the groups, too. All right. Any more, any more questions from, from anyone? Jose, did you have another question or are you just putting the hand, the hand still up? Yeah, I'm terrible with technology. I think I spammed it a few times. I just wanted to make sure. I, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, Viv you. Yeah, Vivian asked, do you get a new group of students each week? Yes, every week you get a new group. It's five days with your students. Uh, Leah, Zane has a question for you, Zane. How yes, so in terms of how much extra money I brought, um, if I just ballpark it at around maybe five pounds per day, because in addition to the stipend that you're provided with, that extra five pounds just gives a nice buffer if you want to splash out a little bit more. So um, if that's a five week program, 10 days a week, 35 days, uh, five pounds a week is 175 pounds. I trust that math, you're, yeah. a, math, you're a math graduate. <laughs> yeah, but it's also like quarter past three in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I give you, yeah, I give you a break on that. Um, which sounds like quite a bit, but um, you know, take as much as you feel comfortable with taking. If you feel like you've taken too much, then you know you don't need to spend it all. If you feel like you needed more, then actually um, getting money out um, in Japan is pretty um, reasonable. It's not too expensive, um, especially uh, it's quite. There's lots of convenience stores where you can take money out of as well. So my answer is vague. <laughs> no, thank you, Zane. And like logistically getting out money from the ATM, uh, all these types of things, we prepare you in an onboarding packet before coming out. So we, we of course help you get settled and, and, and tell you uh, to what, what's best to do when you arrive. Um, and yeah, I think this actually, I'll just go over really quickly since this was a bunch of questions about airfare, lodging, meal, transportation stuff. So like I said, meals, 25 bucks a day, about US dollars, 2,500 yen for five days a week. Uh, so you don't get weekend reimbursements for food. However, you can budget that and eat on the weekends unless you're like Zane and I and like to splurge. That's up to you, as we always keep saying. Um, airfare, we cover up to 1,600 USD. Um, and this is on the website too. Uh, you pay a deposit at the start. And then you get all back but 100 USD. So that's our onboarding fee, 100 bucks. Uh, lodging, you get throughout the program, of course. Uh, just depend, like I mentioned earlier, there's different options depending where you are. Um, you get it at a retreat at the start. You get it in Hakone uh, when we go out to, to cabins for our celebration after training week. And uh, if you ever need to extend, you know, our share houses offer a really cheap, cheap rate if you stay past the program. Uh, and then transportation, Zane mentioned earlier, you get it to and from your house to class every day. And then if, you know, there's activities, there's some requirements or traveling across Japan to your next venue, that's all covered too. And then you get, uh, last year we gave two activity choices for the summer. Um, and that could be, I don't know, in Okinawa, a trip to Tokashiki Island and do some snorkeling uh, to what, the borderless art exhibit in Tokyo by Team Lab, which is super cool. Um, so there's tons of activities and you get to choose two. And like I said, there's a bunch of unofficial stuff too. Um, and so that's kind of the, the subsidies. Yeah. Ryan said team labs. Amazing. It, it really, really is. And we'll probably have that again this summer, pending it happening and pending that staying open. Uh, so we've got that big long list that people can attend and that's, that's provided for you as well. Um, yeah. Do we have any other questions? Have there been any students who took online courses during their internship? Annie? Uh, yeah, actually. I've talked to multiple that 
that did that. Um, and like Jordan kind of mentioned, he did some online. Uh, we had people preparing for, we've had a lot of people preparing for like MCATs and, and different tests to get into grad school too. So there's often a group that's studying together afterwards. Um, and, and yeah, we've had, we've had people take uh, courses as well. Of course, it, you got to watch out for the time zones. Uh, and of course, don't overstress yourself. But if it's important to do it, uh, people have done it. Let's see if I missed anything. No problem, Manny. Uh, any other any other questions? One one last. Uh, oh, I just saw Olivia's question. I, I hope I think I mentioned it, the deadline. First deadline, November thirtieth. Just to say it again. That is very important. Any other any other questions? One or two more, and then we'll we'll head out. I think we are good. Zane, any last words? Well, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this <laughs> session and that you'll apply right now, like immediately. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be watching the application forms tonight and, and see any names that I remember from this. Uh, we really do uh, appreciate everyone coming to this. This is our first First one, we really only marketed to a few schools so far. Um, I, I, we just just started. I just started testing it out um, because I didn't want this webinar to be overwhelming. And so I hope you, and I wanted people to be able to ask questions live like we did here today. So I hopefully that was helpful to you all. And I also appreciate you, you listening to Jordan's story. Uh, we'll continue with some alumni webinars, um, which will include GEC experiences. Maybe we'll do a food one. <laughs> we'll do a housing one. We'll do cultural ones. We'll do all sorts of stuff. Um, and then of course, sign up for the newsletter for our official info sessions, which would be less of this conversation and more of me or Zane or an alumni going through a PowerPoint with all these specifics. Uh, we will be doing those too. But for this one, we just wanted to test out our alumni series. So hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thank you again so much. Uh, email me with any questions, matt at comeonoutjapan.com. Um, and uh, Zane and any other UK people, I think it's time for bed. And the rest of you all, enjoy the remainder of your Friday night. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay in touch with us, and uh, enjoy your weekend. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one.